Well, good morning, Pantano. How are we? See, that's how you respond right there. That, that's what I'm talking about. Y'all a little fired up, ready to go, new series a day, seismic shifts. Uh, before we dive in, we've got some people worshiping with us online today. We've got Stacy from Maui, so we don't feel real bad for you, Stacy. Um, we've got Julissa from Maine, and then apparently Hawaii is a hot spot today. We've got Steve and Amy who are in Hawaii. They say aloha. Um, so aloha to all of you. We're so glad you're with us. Welcome them in with us today, if you don't mind. Well, today we do start a brand new series called Seismic Shifts. And, and here's what I know is that uh, anywhere in the course of history of God's people, anytime that there has been some kind of movement of God's spirit in the world, there has literally been seismic shifts that have happened. The world has shaken. Things have moved. And, and here's what I know is last weekend, uh, the 41 people that were baptized, that is another seismic shift in the lives of people. There was a seismic moment that happened in their world and shifted them into a new place and into a new relationship. And, and it doesn't matter if it's one person, if it's 41, if it's 101, uh, we always understand that God is working seismically in the lives of people. Now, as we start this series, you may have noticed on the stage there are three letters over here to my left, your right, um, that spell the word one. And you know we talk about our ones around here a lot. Um, and, and I'll ask you again, and I may ask you later, how many of you have at least one person in your life far from God? Show of hands. Okay, good. If not, make new friends, right? And, and this is what we are going to do. That word one right there, uh, every time somebody gets baptized, gives their life to Jesus here at Pantano, uh, they're going to get a ball, they're going to write their name on it, and we're going to fill these letters with all of our ones um, until they're full. And then we're going to build more displays, right? Um, and here's what I know. Next week when you walk in, um, everyone that's already been baptized this year, we're going to take care of that. We're going to put those in here. And we just want to visually reach our ones. We want to use it as a reminder each and every week um, that we all have at least one person far from God that needs to know him and seismically shift their lives. Now, it was about 2010. Uh, I took my wife and my girls. Uh, we went to San Diego, California. None of my ladies had ever been that far west. And I hyped up San Diego. Like San Diego is like perfect weather. Uh, the beaches are great. The sun's always out. Uh, the temperature is always just right until the DeVage family goes. Then they had this thing called record cold and record rain in San Diego when I took my ladies. So my ladies are looking at me like, Dad, this place is not that great. I had to go buy my daughter's clothes in San Diego because we didn't pack clothes for that kind of San Diego weather. Uh, and so for three of our five days, we wore sweatpants and sweat jackets and like toboggan type hats all over San Diego. Um, now you guys are like, that's not the San Diego I know. I know. That's the one my family knows. But then the one day we had sun, we decided we're going to take our girls to the San Diego Zoo, which, by the way, is the coup de gras of zoos, right? We understand that. Everybody talks about the San Diego Zoo, so we take our girls. Uh, we're having a great day. We're seeing the animals. We're seeing the exhibits, um, and it really is a great zoo. My wife's like, uh, time out. Uh, I've got three ladies in my house. They all have small bladders, bladders about this big. Um, and so we go to the bathroom a lot in our house. And so she was like, I got to stop and use the bathroom. I was like, great. I'll hang out with the girls. I'm hanging out with our two little girls at the time. And then my oldest daughter looks at me. And she goes, dad, why is the sidewalk waving at us? <laughs> and it was about that time that I thought maybe somebody had slipped me something in a drink and I didn't know it. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. The ground was doing this. Uh-huh, so you know what that is. When you come from the Midwest to California, you're not expecting the sidewalk to do this. And, and I, in that moment, it lasted about 20 seconds, and the ground literally was moving. I'd never been in an earthquake before. I've been in Illinois. I've been in tornadoes. I can handle that. I can outrun a tornado. I've outrun natural disasters before. I did it on, on this week. I was in Orlando this last week. I got out of there. Ian's a jerk, but I beat him. All right, I got out. I can't do anything when the earth decides it wants to move under your feet. All of a sudden, I begin to hear zookeepers on their walkie-talkie going, check the big cats. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and then you hear things like, check the big mammals. And I'm like, is Jumanji about to happen in real life? Is a monkey going to ride a rhinoceros today? Is that what I'm going to get to see? Is that going to happen at the San Diego Zoo? Like, what kind of craziness is about to go down? My wife, God love her, she walked out of the bathroom and she was like, what's going on? 
Now, when your wife walks out of the bathroom and there's been an earthquake and asks what's going on, I'm like, what was going on in there that you didn't feel that out here, right? <laughs> like, at that moment, I'm like, did you not? She's like, what is going on? I was like, the ground just moved. She goes, I didn't feel that. And I had this moment of perplexion where I was like, how do you not feel the earth move under your, th- under your feet? And then my second thought was, is this just a precursor of what's coming? Is it going to be a bigger one? Was the ground going to split open? I mean, I'd seen Hollywood movies. Like, I thought I was going to get swallowed into the hole. I thought it was over for me. Then it turned my mind back to the 1989 World Series. I was watching on TV as a kid, game three. It was the Battle of the Bay, right? You guys remember this? The Oakland Athletics versus San Francisco Giants. I didn't care who won at all, but I love baseball. And then as I'm watching the TV, I remember seeing the camera start to shake and the stadium start to move. Um, And they had a 7.1 earthquake at the beginning of game three of the World Series. And, And I remember watching the images of like the bridge collapsing. Do you remember this? And then I literally saw images of the the hole in the ground where the the earth had literally shifted. And it had changed neighborhoods. It had moved families. It had moved houses. It had literally and figuratively, everything was different. See, when seismic things happen, everyone notices and is impacted by it. The interesting image that I remember is all the people that were out in the streets after that. They were showing news images, and what it literally did, the seismic shift caused people to scatter into the streets, scatter into their neighborhoods, scatter into businesses, looking for people that desperately needed help in that moment. And it made me start to look at the seismic moments of my own life that altered the way that I've lived and moved. Uh, I began to think of things like my family home burning down in 1983. That was a seismic shift in our life. My dad moving our family to Florida to to start over, that that was a seismic shift. I had a life-altering back injury when I was in high school. That was a seismic shift. My dad giving his life to Jesus when I was in the sixth grade, massively seismic shift in our life. My decision to go to Bible college, while weird in the moment, was a very seismic shift. My decision to ask my now wife, Laura, out, which had to be a seismic shift because I don't know why she said yes. <laughs> but she said yes. And then we moved to the state of Texas in 2002, seismic shift. By the way, if you're from Texas, understand there is more to the United States than just Texas. <laughs> Not much, but there's something else other than Texas, right? I always joke with people, both my daughters are native Texans, so if they ever secede from the union, they're my ticket back in. Um, <laughs> And I will sell shares for anybody who wants to go with us, all right? Um, But it was a seismic shift in our family. Having our children, that wasn't a seismic shift. That was an earthquake. That was a big one. Uh, That was huge. Moving to Ohio to lead a church, that was a seismic shift. Leading through COVID, seismic shift. Moving to Tucson, seismic shift. And and every time there's been a ground-shaking, seismic moment in our life, It's altered everything and moved us closer to what God had in store for us. Every time. And God has continually gathered me and my family to scatter us wherever it is he wants to do his work. He's always gathered us to scatter us to help other people see Jesus. Every single time there's been a seismic shift in our life, he's always scattered us to something new, to something better. And I wonder about you. What have been the seismic shifts in your life? As you look back and you watch where God has moved the ground and altered your journey, where has he scattered you to help you matter? And sometimes you don't see it in the moment. Maybe it's when you lost a loved one. It was a seismic shift. Maybe it was when you got the diagnosis. It was a seismic shift. Maybe it was the career change that moved you across the country. Maybe it was the birth of a child. Maybe it was the loss of a child. And it was a seismic shift. If you know Jesus, if you're in this room and you know Jesus, if you're online and you know Jesus, maybe that was the moment when you finally surrendered your life to Christ and said, I'll go and do whatever it is you want me to do. By the way, be careful with that prayer. He'll send you places like the Midwest. 
in the middle of winter. <laughs> See, whatever the case, God has gathered all of us here. He's gathered all of us here to scatter us out there. Like, you understand, if all we do is gather here to sing some songs, which is great, and to listen to some crazy guy talk for a few minutes, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about Saul. He preached last week, right? (laughs) By the way, wasn't that fantastic last week? Saul did an amazing job. But if that's all we're doing, then we're not doing what we're called to. We're not called to just gather and, and hang out and have some fun. Like that, That's part of it. We have, fun. we have a lot of fun around here, don't we, Pantano? Okay, I can't say we have a lot of fun around here. And you're like, yeah, woo. Sure do. It's great stuff. I just ate breakfast in the cafe. Let that settle, Pastor Man. We're good. Woohoo, right? But what if we realized that we actually are here because something is bigger going on? That we're actually here because God wants to scatter us to help other people matter. Uh, maybe, maybe it's in this moment that God is going to do a seismic shift in your life. And he's gathered us here to scatter us out there. In fact, uh, as we start this series, I want you to write this down. We gather to scatter to help people matter. We gather in this place to scatter out of this place to help people out there that don't know they matter, understand they have a God that they matter to a whole lot that we gather to scatter to help people matter. So over the next six weeks, we're going to walk through this seismic shift of God's people in the early church in the book of Acts. And today we see that that God was going to use the seismic spirits that he's going to fill his people with and alter the landscape of all of humanity, which, by the way, the reason we are where we are today doing what we do is because of what we're going to read about in the book of Acts. That's how we got here that he's going to use each person in his church to send a ground-altering shock into the community. Aftershock, after aftershock, regions, countries, and across the globe. So let's jump in. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. It says, once when he was eating with them, talking about Jesus, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the what? What's the word he uses? The gift he promised them. By the way, I, I love this. He says it's a gift. Tell them not go anywhere until they they get this gift. And then verse 5, John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the what? The Holy Spirit. So this is where God is preparing his people for what is to come. He's letting them know that the the gift of the Holy Spirit is coming. Now, I don't think they really understood what was coming. I don't think they understood what was happening. I'm not sure they were comprehending what Jesus was about to unleash in a seismic way through them. And I love that Jesus teases them with a gift. Anybody like getting gifts? Just curious. Show of hands. You like getting gifts? I like getting gifts. Now, some of you guys are like, I just like giving them. But secretly, you like getting them too. <laughs> I love getting gifts. I love giving gifts. But it's kind of like on Christmas, like a month before Christmas, there's a box that maybe shows up in front of the Christmas tree. And you walk over and you're like, I wonder who that's for. And you see your name on it. And then you spend the next month on a full-on, like, you're in sleuth mode. So you walk by it and you're like, oops, I touched it. Well, that's not soft. (laughs) Then you walk by and you're like, doesn't smell like anything. I don't know what that is. You kick it. You hope there's nothing alive in it. You look to see if there's been holes poked in it to see if you can figure out what's inside of it. But there's something about the anticipation of a gift. And I love that Jesus is giving them an anticipation of what might be. Like, we know that that it's God's spirit because we have hindsight, right? We can go back and read this. In fact, it's the same spirit Jesus is going to give them and give us that resurrected Jesus from the dead. And so, church, why is it that we have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now dwelling within us, and yet all we ever want to do is gather without the scatter to help people know they matter? Like, it's the same spirit that makes the mountains move and the earth shake. It's a seismic spirit that we have within us. And yet sometimes we walk around like it's not there. And the next set of verses lets us know they they might not have understood what what God was about to do through them either. Verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking, Lord, so has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? They don't get it. They don't understand They think an earthly kingdom is coming. They're kind of like we are with the royal family. They were kind of obsessed with being royal. They wanted to be that. 
They wanted an earthly kingdom. They wanted a palace. They wanted rooms. They, they, they wanted to lord over people a little bit. But what they don't understand is that what is about to happen is going to change humanity for all of history and all of eternity. They just don't understand it yet. It wasn't just for a generation on this finite ball of dirt that we're turning on right now called earth. It alters everything. It changes everything. Like, like this spirit that they're going to get, it's going to shift families. It's going to shift generations. It's going to shift communities, regions, countries, and all of eternity. People will be resurrected and rescued from hell. <laughs> By the way, we understand hell's a real thing, right? Like there are people in your life right now, there are people you pass every day that need the hope that you and I have and need the power of the spirit that you and I have. They need to know that they matter because they are destined right now for hell. It's one of my favorite scriptures, Jude 23. I say it all the time. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. By the way, that's snatching people from the pits of hell. Like we have a spirit inside of us, the seismic spirit to help people see Jesus. See, when we understand the spirit, like the early believers are going to understand it, people will be rescued from hell. People will find hope and healing, both physically and spiritually. People will be scattered to help people know that they matter. Like Jesus is about to use a seismic shift in his church with his seismic spirit filling them and filling the world. But it's through his believers. It's through his church. Verse 7 I love Jesus. He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they're not for you to know. Uh, isn't that funny to you? Like, Jesus is like, I don't know. Dad can do what he wants. That's not for you to know. But what he does say is, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my what? What's the word he uses? Witnesses. Telling people about me where? Everywhere. Where did he say? Everywhere. Everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, the ends of the earth. Like, I love Jesus' reply to their question here. He tells them that the time is urgent. He's not trying to hide anything from him. He's like, I don't, I don't know the answer when, when I'm going to return. But I know it could be tomorrow. It could be next hour. It could be 100 years from now. But there's an urgency to that. Like, I'm glad I don't know when he's coming back. There's part of me that wants to know. I'm like, come on, man, just give me a hint. But I'm really glad I don't know because if I knew, I might be lazy in the walk he's given me. If I knew when he was coming back, I might just go, I got time. It's kind of like when you say after the first year, I'll go to the gym on Monday. Isn't it amazing how there's never Monday in your life when you say those words? I'll help somebody see Jesus on Monday. No, you won't. Because there's no urgency to that statement when it's like Jesus could return right now. This moment. Then I have to look in the mirror and go, what have I done? Where have I gone? Have I gone everywhere and done everything that God has called me to go do? He doesn't say just go somewhere. He says go everywhere. Right, let me give you the context of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Because if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard that. And it's interesting because when you put it in context, I think it helps us understand. So Jerusalem. Jerusalem is your, your hometown context. When, when he has this conversation with, the, with the, the disciples, you know where they're at? They're in Jerusalem. So when he says, go into Jerusalem, he says, first, I want you to go into your local context. Go into your city. So if he were preaching to us right now, if Jesus were standing here, he'd say, okay, Pantano, therefore go to Tucson and do ministry right here. Help as many people know Jesus in Tucson as possible. By the way, not hard. 850,000 people in our city don't know Jesus. Walk outside. Walk into your place of work. Walk into the gym. Walk into Starbucks. Walk into Fry's or Safeway or wherever you shop, Walmart, whatever it be for you, okay? He's like, go into Tucson. That's your local context. Wherever you go to bed at night and wake up in the morning, start there. Then he says, not only Jerusalem, but then he says Judea which by the way, Judea would be the region. So that might be Pima County, uh, that might be Nogales, uh, that might be uh, the greater Arizona area. But he's like, you go into Jerusalem, you go into Judea, you go to as many people as you can in your area and help them see me. Then he says this interesting one, he says Samaria. And I think we gloss over that, we're like, oh, it's just another place to go. See, when a Jewish voice would have heard Samaria, they wouldn't have heard what you and I hear. 
See, Samaritans to the Jewish people were not people. They were deemed less than. They were inferior. They weren't really even human. They had a term for them. They called them half-breed dogs. By the way, that is not a term of endearment, in case you're wondering. They didn't even see them as human. So when Jesus says, go to Jerusalem, go to Judea, but then go to Samaria, what he's saying there is, you go to the places nobody else will actually go. You reach the people that nobody else actually wants to reach. You go to the people that people don't see as people. And you help them know that they're my people. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And then he says, ends of the earth. See, when Jesus gives that directive, he meant their known world and beyond. See, they they didn't know the world like we know it. So for them to go to the ends of the earth literally felt like they might go to the ends of the earth, like they might fall off the end of the earth. But he was gathering them to scatter them. He was about to use his powerful spirit to send them places they could have never imagined they were going to go. He was going to literally send them everywhere. Jesus is calling them and calling us to the same thing. That's our calling too, by the way. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. We're called to be his witness everywhere. Everywhere. Not just somewhere. Not just over there. Everywhere. Everywhere. I saw this lived out in front of me about a week ago. I've got a friend named Joe, and Joe and his wife Ellen just started coming to Pantano back in April. And actually, last Sunday, I got to baptize Joe and his wife. It was really cool. Yeah, you, please applaud that. That's amazing. And let me tell you how this played out, because Joe is taking this everywhere thing really seriously. Joe's actually retired from the Air Force, and um, he actually retired twice from the Air Force. He went back and oversaw some things at the Boneyard out here. Um, and, and Joe has got the best voice known to man. He, he should be in radio. And I tell him all the time, he's got a face for radio. Like, he should be in radio. It's perfect, right? And, and, and so I, I just love Joe, and we started playing golf together. And so about a week ago, Joe and I are playing golf out at Del Lago Golf Course out in Vail area here. If you live in the area, you know where I'm talking about. And, and so it's just the two of us, and we get paired up with a single, a guy named Jeff. Jeff, if you're here today, I'm really stoked you're here, by the way. And, and I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I, for what I do, I don't like to scare people out of the gate. So I don't walk up on the first tee and be like, hey, my name's Trevor. I'm a pastor. Good to meet you. I don't do that because that freaks people out. Because usually they're like, wait, you're a pastor? And I'm like, I know. It's a whole thing. We'll talk about that later. All right? So I, I, I kind of ease into it with people. I don't want to freak people out. Uh, so I'm just going to go play golf. Um, Joe didn't get that memo. So on the, like, the second swing of the day, Joe looks at Jeff, he goes, Joe, I, or Jeff, I got to tell you about my church. And I was like, oh, bro, slow your roll. He's like, it's amazing. God's changed my life. God's doing amazing things to my wife and I. Uh, I mean, he just won't shut up. <laughs> and as the pastor, I'm like, I should be like, woo. And in my back of my mind, I'm like, bro, you're going to blow this. Stop it. <laughs> and for 17 holes, Joe doesn't shut up about his faith. And for 17 holes, I'm like, shut up about your faith. And then God was like, what is wrong with you? You lead a church. (laughs) You know what happened on the 18th tee box? Jeff looks at me and he goes, hey, tell me the name of your church again. And I told him and he wrote it down on the scorecard. I was like, wait, we're keeping score with the church name now? I I didn't know that was a thing. And he said, tell me, remind me, remind me your service times. And I told him. And then Joe's like, I'm getting baptized Sunday, you should come. And I'm like, oh man, we were so close, right? (laughs) I love Joe. Because Joe understands everywhere. He understands that wherever you are is an opportunity to share that faith that's so new to him yet so fresh. And it made me realize something this last week is that, and I want you to write this down, and it may take you a minute to marinate over this, but it's just simply this. We're not called to be witnesses when it's convenient to us. We're called to be witnesses in the convenience of where we are. Like, I, I'm, I want to say that again, because I, I think we need to let that sink in. We're not called to be witnesses when it's convenient to us. We're called to be witnesses in the convenience of where we are. Everywhere we are, there's a convenient moment to share the faith in which we've been given. And it doesn't take anything more than helping someone know that they matter. Loving people where they are. By the way, the Greek word for everywhere, it's really interesting. 
You know what the Greek word for everywhere means? Everywhere. <laughs> Some of you all thinking, that's what, that's what you got right there? <laughs> I, I'll tell you why I say that. Because there's a lot of time you read these words in the original language, you're like, oh, it meant something so much this way or this way. I looked that up, and literally in the program I'm looking at, and I'm reading through commentaries, I'm like, what's the word everywhere mean? It's got to be something deep and spiritual. And it was like, everywhere. <laughs> the definition meaning wherever you go, everywhere. And I was like... Oh, so everywhere. <laughs> I'm a quick study, by the way, right? <laughs> this is what I love about Jesus. He loves to gather us, to scatter us, to help people matter. He loves to do that in us. Then we get a glimpse of the Spirit falling and God preparing his people to scatter with his powerful Spirit in them. Go down to Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. So let me just stop there for a minute. They, they're gathering what is about to be the beginning of the scattering of God's people, uh, of God's church, of going out into the world. And he's going to let them unwrap this gift of the Holy Spirit. So it says all the believers have gathered together. Day of Pentecost, they're all in one place from all these regions, from all over the place, uh, not all of which speak the same language. And they're all gathered, much like we are now. They're all gathered. And I know not all of you in here know Jesus, but, but those of you that do, all the believers were gathered. That's the day of Pentecost. And in that moment, verse 2, it says, Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Now, this is how I think, but I, if I was there and I saw little tongues, like blah, 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 all fiery, I'd have been like, uh, what's going on right now? Like, welcome to my head. That's how I function, right? Anybody else think that's just weird or crazy? Okay, cool. Just me. Back to the text. <laughs> Verse 4, everyone present was filled with what? The Holy Spirit. And they began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. By the way, I think this is one of the most misinterpreted scriptures in all the Bible. And I don't have time to unpack all of it today, but here's what I do know. Every time I go overseas, I pray for the gift of tongues. And I, like I was in India and I'm on stage, I'm like, God, give me the gift of tongues. And my, my friend Ajay Law, who's a missionary, he goes, you're actually speaking in them. That's why I'm interpreting for you. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. I told you I'm a quick study. Back to the text, right? At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Verse 7, they were completely what? What's the word? Amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, the Parthenians, the Medes, the Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, uh, basically from everywhere. And, and Jews and converts to Judaism. And we all hear these people speaking in our own language about the wonderful things that What? God has done. And I love this. They, they stood there amazed and perplexed. I don't know if you know this. We own a rabbit. I'm going to let that settle in for just a second. It lives in my house. People have dogs and those other animals that I don't like, and we have a rabbit. And my rabbit every morning, this is how dumb rabbits are. He's amazed and perplexed every day. I walk over to him every morning with a little piece of banana, and he looks amazed, and then he's like, huh, I feel like I should have seen this before. <laughs> I feel like right here, they're standing there like my rabbit does every morning, kind of like, what just happened? And I'm a little perplexed by what's going on right now. And then they said, what can this mean? What can this mean? Like, I love this moment. They're amazed and perplexed. Can I just tell you, a week ago Monday, I was in this room with a couple thousand of y'all, and I was amazed and perplexed at the same time. We had a worship night, and I was amazed and perplexed. It was one of the greatest single moments I've ever been a part of in my entire life. And you know when you're perplexed, you just can't put your finger on what it is, but you know it was something. That's how it felt. Amazed and perplexed. Uh, like, I love what, what God is doing in this text. He's preparing them to scatter them. He's giving them a glimpse of how seismic shift is going to happen in the world. 
He's showing them what it's going to look like. He's about to shift them and send them to someplace else. He's about to move and make with them. And after this moment, Peter steps forward and preaches the first, the first sermon. And I wish I had time to read through the whole thing and unpack it with you. And it wasn't one of those sermons where you're like, oh, I bet people far from God are really going to like this one. Like he went kind of guns a blazing. He, he kind of came hard, especially after the religious elites. And at the end of his message, 3,000 people give their life to Jesus. 3,000. Like, I mean, get your head around that. 3,000 people give their life to Jesus. Like there was a seismic shift in their lives. That they heard something that shifted something so radically in them. They were like, I've got to know this Jesus that you're talking about. I've got to know this seismically shifting God that you keep talking about. Because their community from that moment on was altered. Their ground had shifted to holy ground. They're living differently. They, things have changed. The, the neighbors are, 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 are moving in new directions. The neighborhoods are changing in their community. Their families are shifting. See, when a, a seismic shift happens in your life, here's what the result is. Listen to verse 43 or 42. Uh, the first word there, by the way, is three letters. What's that word? All. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, which, by the way, is very spiritual. We should share more meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. I love this. It doesn't say some of them. It doesn't say a few of them. It doesn't say a handful of them. It actually says all of them gathered together. See, when God seismically shifts your life, community is the response. Community is the response. Community inside of the church is what changes communities outside the church. That's why at Pantano, we're, we're so bent on getting you into our discipleship pathway, which is rooted. If you've not been through our 10-week discipleship experience called Rooted, then I would highly encourage you to sign up for the next round of that coming in a couple months because it, it is a way to get into community that will seismically shift the community around you. But our response when we know Jesus should be community because the response of deep community and the power of God's spirit is verse 43, where it says a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. See, God's seismic spirit leads to community that brings godly awe. Like, when was the last time you were just in awe of God? Like, when was the last time that, that we gathered together and you were just simply in awe of what God was doing in the midst of his people? When was the last time you had an awe moment with all of God's people? My prayer is it happens every time we gather. But I also hope that it happens on Monday mornings at 5 a.m. And Wednesday afternoons at 3 in the afternoon. Or on the tea box with someone you've been paired with. That you're just in awe of what God is doing. Can I just tell you one of my favorite things about our church? I think y'all do this really well. I think Pantano is a place that, that we see a lot of awesome things because we get to see the awe of God all the time. It's funny, I, I was at a conference with other leaders around the country, and, and they were asking me on Sunday night, they were like, so, so how's Pantano really? I was like, really awesome. And then they would say things like, okay, I, I hear you, but I know, I mean, it's the church, so how are the people? I'm like, I'm not following. I'm like, well, how are they really? And I'm like, no, they're really awesome. Because, because I really believe that the culture that's been laid in this church for the last 60 years has been one of wonder and awe when God shows up. And we anticipate God's going to do something. See, when God's church experiences the power of the Spirit, it changes everything. You can't be the same. When you live with wonder and awe, you can change the dull and the mundane to something astronomical. When you live in community of a seismic shifting power of the Holy Spirit, you can alter marriages, you can alter families, you can alter communities, cities, regions, and dare I actually say the world. The ends of the earth. 
Look at verse 44. All the believers met together in one place. They shared everything they had. They sold their property and their possessions. They shared their money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, this is my favorite part, each day the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. See, that means the Spirit of God was working so heavy in their community that there were people just showing up going, I don't know what it is y'all are doing or what you have, but I want in. And they're like, come on, show up. Come, come walk in the door with, come be with, here, we'll pick you up. We'll cook you a meal. Unless you can't cook, then don't cook people a meal. Send them someone that can cook them a meal. Like, we're going to love people where they are, and they're going to add to the number daily those that are being saved. Whether it's 41 or 1, it doesn't matter that one more would know Jesus. So where does scattering start? Scattering starts with God's people gathering. It starts right here. Gathering for a purpose, gathering and preparing. You, you understand when we gather, this, is, this isn't just for a good time, which it is, by the way. I have a whole lot of fun with y'all. But that's not the only reason. We gather with a purpose. We gather to prepare. We gather to care for one another. We gather to help send each other back out. We gather to get filled but we gather with the real intent of scattering. That's why we gather. God started by scattering them into their community. And what was the result? He added to their number daily, those are being saved. Uh, just quick question. How many of you guys wanna have an impact for the kingdom of God? Just show of hands. Okay, wonderful. Because if you hadn't raised your hands, I'd have to go start over and do something else, okay? If we're going to seismically shift our neighborhoods, our communities, our city, our region, the ends of the earth, our filling must lead to spilling. Like you can't just come in here and get filled up one time and be like, good to go. How many of you guys drive a car? Anybody drive a car? How many of you guys bought one of these newfangled cars that when you put gas in it, it just stays full for the rest of its life? If you have one of those, I want to know where you bought it because I'm going to go buy one. Because you've got to mortgage your house to fill your car up right now, right? But about every, I don't know, five, six days, depending on how much you drive, maybe two or three, you've got to fill that tank back up, right? But you don't fill it up to sit at the gas station and, hope, and just let the engine run until you've got to fill it back up again, do you? Then why do we do that with our faith? Why do we come in here and fill up and then we just sit in hopes that something's going to happen? We come back here to fill back up so we can go out there and spill it out. In fact, you fill to spill. We gather to scatter. Why? Because any time in human history that God scattered his people, a seismic shift has happened. And the world has been radically different. We gather you every week to give you marching orders to go scatter into the world around you and help people know that they matter. So what does this mean for us this week? What happens when a church takes seriously the call to use our seismic power in the world around us? I'll tell you what, people learn they matter. People learn they matter. They matter to God and that God wants to use them with a hope and a help that you and I have. A seismic shift takes place in their life. I love last hour, there's a, a young mom in our church that brought a young lady that she works with at the school she works at. She goes, she just needs to know she matters. And man, did she find out today she matters. Some of you sitting here, you're here right now, someone invited you. Let me tell you why they invited you. Because you matter. And they want you to know you matter, not just to them, but to God. So here's your marching orders this week, Pantano. I, I want you to find one person in your life that needs to know they matter. That needs to know they matter. I'm going to ask again, how many of you have at least one person in your life far from God? Just show of hands. Great. Well, if you know that person, guess what you're going to do with them this week? You're going to help them know they matter. You're going to call them. You're going to have a conversation with them. You're going to enter their life and help them know they matter. 
Because we gather to scatter to help people do what? Matter. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, here's what I hope you heard today. That God wants to seismically shift your life to matter in a way that maybe you never knew you could. And I want you to know you matter deeply to us and you matter deeply to the kingdom of God. And you have a purpose and a hope. We would love to be a part of that with you. Like the 41 people last weekend or the one last hour that was baptized right out here in our courtyard. We want to celebrate with you too. So I'm going to ask you to stand. I want to pray with you. And uh, don't go anywhere. We're going to worship a little bit together. We need, to, we need to just see what the Spirit wants to speak. And so I want to pray for us. And then we're going to continue in our worship together. Let's pray. Father, today, God, my prayer right now is that you would seismically move in the lives of your people. God, for those of us that claim you, for those of us that call you by name, for those of us that have been transformed by you, God, I pray that you would seismically shift us with your spirit into the community around us. God, scatter us today. God, move us into every nook and cranny, every shadow, every dark place, every place where there's people that need hope and a a mattering to their soul. God, use us to do that this week. Give us opportunities today before before we ever even get home. God, for some of us, it's someone in our home that needs to know they matter. God, if there's anybody here today that they don't know why they're here, but they're here, God, I pray that you would seismically shift their soul to be filled with the same spirit that those of us that know you have. God, scatter us. Help us reach one person this week far from you. We love you. It's your name we pray. And all God's people said.